Thank you, Claire. Uh, I'm Gordon McLean, the Early Years and Parenting Officer with Learning Through Landscapes. So I'll be starting us off and then passing over to Steve. Um, so just before I start talking about health and well-being and the benefits um, that outdoor play can bring to our health and well-being, uh, I'll just introduce Learning Through Landscapes. So we're a leading outdoor learning and play charity that supports educators in maximising their use of the outdoors to support learning and development. Uh, we're very lucky to have David Attenborough as our patron. And this year we are celebrating 30 years. So may not be celebrating quite in the way that we thought we would be, uh, but we are yet still really pleased to still be going strong. So how do we support educators uh, in all areas from parents, early years, primary and secondary? Well, we run training courses and events. We have membership publications, uh, as well as projects and funded core work as well. We also deliver site visits, so we can come out to settings and work with you directly and have a look at what you've got currently and maybe any changes that could be made. Uh, this year, we're also very excited to be running the summer session. So as Claire mentioned, we are we're really gutted that we've not been able to come out and work face to face with you all for the last three months or so. So we've put together some online training courses that will be taking place um, in July. So please do visit ltl.org.uk for more information about them. Uh, and we'd love it if you could sign up and join us. So let's have a think about health and well-being. Why is it so important? I think most of us that are here today would agree that the early years are one of the most important stages of an individual's learning and education journey. If our children's health and well-being is in a poor place to begin with, uh, progress in all areas of learning becomes much more limited and difficult. Without a solid foundation, it becomes really tricky to build more. And that's not just true for the construction industry, but very much relevant in learning and development too. So part of our role is to support our children so that they can maximize their potential. If we consider Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we know that people must have their fundamental needs met. This starts with the basics, our physiological needs. Are our children fed? Are they rested? Another basic need is safety, security, and then comes our social needs, such as friendship, family. Have our children had a hug before they come in and see us? It's also necessary to experience success and achievement, increasing confidence and self-esteem. We've got an opportunity to make our children's early years of education a positive experience. I think this is an absolutely wonderful opportunity. Getting children excited about learning, making new discoveries, acquiring new skills and abilities, this is part of that strong foundation that supports them and sets them up on a positive learning journey. Outdoor playing experiences are very well positioned to support all of these needs. I remember I was listening to Anna Fgrave at a conference in Glasgow a few years ago, and something that really stood out from what she was saying was the importance of ensuring that our children are engaged. And she said that this is much more important and positive than children that are occupied. You might be thinking, oh, come on, Gordon, that's a bit of a, a subtle and unimportant difference. But actually, if we uh, dissect that a little bit, an occupied child may be more passive or following a much more prescribed activity rather than following their own intrinsic motivations. Allowing children to follow their own interests is something that we know is important. It's something that should be genuinely catered for within our settings. And I think that the outdoors is such a fantastic way to cater to children's self-led learning. Well-structured, interesting and diverse outdoor spaces, particularly ones that offer quality access to nature, can be a great way to accomplish this. We want to support children to develop the knowledge and understanding, as well as skills, capabilities, that they will need to use to support their own well-being now and in the future. So what is health and well-being? Well, it can include many different things. And depending on where you are, you might be working from different national documents. But I guess the fundamentals are the same all across the globe. 
Um, I'm just going to read to you just now a quote from one of the Scottish national documents. It is called Health and Wellbeing Across Learning. And it says, the mental, emotional, social and physical well-being of everyone within a learning community should be positively developed by fostering a safe, caring, supportive, purposeful environment that enables the development of relationships based on mutual respect. The four aspects of well-being are inextricably linked and are only separated here for practical purposes. So in short, we can break it down in many different ways. We can label it in the ways that we see fit. We could be using the early learning goals, personal, social and emotional development. We could be using the Scottish ones I just mentioned, mental, emotional, social and physical development. Or maybe you use SPECL, which is social, physical, emotional, cognitive and language development. But at the end of the day, all of these areas need to be supported to retain a positive health and well-being. Uh, the work that I'm most involved in with Learning Through Landscapes, um, well, before lockdown was a thing, uh, is nurturing nature. And with nurturing nature, I'm very fortunate to work with early year settings across Scotland. A part of my remit for this work is to work with settings that are in areas of multiple deprivation. Uh, we work closely with members of staff from the nursery and roughly 10, 10 families at a time. We take the children with a, a parent or other significant adult and a member of staff and access areas of local green space. If, when I say local green space, that can be anything from a park. Sometimes settings are very lucky to have access to a, a good wooded space. But more often than not, sometimes it's the forgotten corners of the community that have been left to overgrow with a few trees and few bushes that sometimes they can be wonderful magic spaces that really do support outdoor play and learning. Uh, I could spend all afternoon talking about nurturing nature, uh, the benefits that it brings and the way that we do it, um, but I know I don't have that time. Uh, but I do mention it just now as visiting these natural spaces with groups of children and working with groups on their own sites is uh, where some of these stories that I'll be uh, relating to have come from. Something else that we really need to keep in mind and consider is the UNCRC, which is the United Nations Charter for the Rights of the Child. Now, this is um, being uh, agreed upon by 196 countries, 196 have signed up. So this makes it the most widely adopted international human rights treaty. Yeah, I'm not going to go into massive depth on this today because uh, it could be its own session or two probably, um, but it is very, very important that we keep the UNCRC in our minds when we are working with children and families. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of the articles just now. Uh, article two is non-discrimination. So the convention applies to every child without discrimination whatever their ethnicity, gender, religion, language, abilities, or any other status, whatever they think or say, whatever their family background. So put simply, these rights apply to all children across the globe. Now, Article 24, 28, 29, and 31 say that our children have the right to the best possible health, the right to free education, the right for that education to develop every child's personality, talents and abilities to the full, and all children have the right to play. Article 42 mentions that governments must actively work to make sure that children and adults know about the convention. So this is important and let's keep it in mind when we work with families and children. So one of the major effects of being outdoors is how it can support physical development. Uh, so often when I'm working with groups of children in different nurseries, um, if we're walking to a park or the local green space, I notice that children can struggle, even just with the, the short five, 10 minute walk to get there. And this could be the child that gets uh, taken everywhere in a buggy or dropped off in a taxi car or local bus in the morning. And the trips, might initially take, take a while and children find it difficult. And this, this can sometimes be used as a, a reason or maybe it's more of an excuse to, to not go out on these external 
um, trips. But what we find time and time again is that after just a few short journeys, the children build a stamina, a physical resilience. Which, and that just makes the whole thing much easier to do. But I think it's also really important that we consider the benefits that take place within these journeys. Children are learning about appropriate movements. They're taking part in a routine. We know routine is so important for developing health and well-being as well. Children are learning how to um, walk along a, a pavement beside a road safely, how, when, where to cross a road. But there's also lots of learning kind of cognitive developments that are going on as well. How often is that impromptu game of I spy just started? Children spotting colours, um, thinking about letters. Maybe you're looking in people's gardens and observing the nature that's there. Can you see any animals? What evidence is there of that? There's also the children that like to walk along and balance on the lines on the ground. Or maybe they're avoiding the cracks that they see in the pavement. This is developing their, their physical literacy, their motor skills, sense of balance. And these are all so important and part of our physical well-being. The outdoors can often bring a, a creative element to physical play as well. Playing in the sand, water, mud, natural spaces are particularly good. Running or moving over uneven terrain, climbing, lots of movement up, over, under, through. Things like this are well, most importantly, enjoyable. Let's remember that right to play. However, they also bring lots of health and well-being benefits too. I've mentioned balance, better understanding themselves, becoming more confident, becoming masters of themselves. We develop those motor skills and increase that confidence. Children will enjoy and have develop a, an intrinsic desire to continue with their physical exercise pushing themselves further and setting themselves developmentally appropriate challenges. And we hope that this will encourage more physical activity. I think the outdoors often has fewer barriers than indoors as well. And I don't just mean the corridors, the bookshelves, the tables. How often have you been in a setting and you might hear, uh, Cara, could you stop running please, walking shoes? Uh, Jamie, indoor voices, please. Well, what if we let Cara and Jamie out into the back garden? Let Jamie discover the extent of his vocal range, again, developing that mastery over self. Let Cara run, burn off the energy. Let her engage in the movement that she needs. You may have heard the phrase, how can children bounce off the walls if we take the walls away? I want to mention uh, there's a video uh, called Five Extra Years. You can find it on YouTube. Um, and it's a video that has interviewed quite a few different children and asking them what they would do with an extra five years. And it can be quite hard hitting, especially at the end. The video is describing uh, some of the impacts of the sedentary lifestyle. And sedentary lifestyle can have a huge impact on our health and well-being, including shorter lives. And I think it's, it's really easy to fall into the trap of the sedentary lifestyle, especially the last few months during lockdown. Uh, I don't know about you, but sitting down and moving less has become much more frequent. But even before lockdown was even a thing, how easy is it to get up in the morning, sit down for breakfast, drive to work, sit down at work, drive home, cook dinner, sit down, eat, move to a sofa, sit, read, watch telly, go to bed. Okay, maybe I'm oversimplifying it a little bit there, and many of us are maybe on our feet during work, but how, how much do we actually move? Especially these days where technological advances are just ever increasing. Humans for thousands and thousands of years have been hunter-gatherers. We've moved all day, exerted ourselves, and that's just the necessity to survive. But now we live in an instant gratification culture and moving about is much less frequent and a sedentary lifestyle is more common. I hear really positive things from uh, families, from parents, from educators, practitioners, wherever you are, it could be childminders, anyone, but those that work with children or have children tell me, 
oh my goodness, it was great. See, she's been outside all morning or all afternoon or all day. Behaviour increases. Concentration can increase. And one of the favourite ones, especially with parents, is that the children often get a better night's rest. We know how our own well-being improves through a good night's sleep. But one of the great things is children getting that good night's sleep. And parents often tell me that it, it can result in them getting a better night's sleep as well. So our emotional well-being. This refers to recognising, understanding and effectively managing our feelings and emotions. The outdoors is a fantastic vehicle for supporting children's emotional well-being. Again, I've worked with many children that have struggled with their emotions. Could be those coming into nursery in the morning, tears at the front door or tears or a fight before leaving the house. Could be moving into an overwhelming environment. It could be leaving your loved ones, your relations at the door. Or for some of us, it could just be that we're uh, not mourning people. But by being outdoors, I've already mentioned the access to additional space. And this can be great for children's emotions. It can allow them to have the space that they need. We need to remember behaviour is a, a form of communication. Children might be saying, I'm not comfortable. But outdoors, we can have the, the space to be close to our friends if we want that support and that social interaction. Or maybe we can go and we can play on our own on a more individual basis and develop relationships at a comfortable rate. I've worked with several children over the years and I find it really difficult uh, when I see children that have been labelled as a, a bad child, a naughty child, a difficult child. Thinking of one, one wee boy in particular I was working with a few years ago and I just met this group of children. I was about to work with them at the nursery. And before we'd even gone outside, I had a, a practitioner walk past and, oh, is that who you're working with? Well, you'll be needing a, a strong coffee when you get back. A few minutes later, there was another uh, member of staff came past and, oh, oh, it's them. We'll be lucky if we see you again next week. I'm glad they're outside. Let's put a predetermined negative judgment in my head that I, I just didn't need, frankly. These, were, these are children that I want to see for who they are. But fortunately, over the weeks, we went outside, we played, we had a great time together. And a, a different practitioner, the one that was out with me, said, wow, he's a leader, he's confident, he's supportive. He is an absolute joy to be with. When I compare this to another child I worked with, it must be six or seven years ago now. He was another child that had been labelled from a young age and he'd had a particularly difficult day at school. I remember chatting to him at the end of the day in the playground and what he said to me has stuck with me and it was heartbreaking. He looked up and said, Gordon, I'm just a naughty boy. Why should I even try? As I say, this was, this was awful to hear. This is a child that has not had that opportunity of variety. That communication, that behaviour, children need have different needs. Some children will thrive outdoors where they don't thrive indoors. So let's give our children these opportunities. Let's remember Article 3 of the UNCRC. The best interest of the child must be a top priority in all decisions and actions. That affect, wish, uh, that affect children. And Article 13, the right to express wishes. One of the first groups that I worked with when joining LTL, uh, we'd been using a small piece of woodland. And, well, I say woodland, it was a few trees and a couple of bushes uh, at the side of a path just across the road from the nursery. And one of the wee boys that we were working with, he was in the autism spectrum. And when he walked, he, he held himself close shoulders up, a very self-defensive posture. But over the weeks, as we kept coming back to this space, he developed a relationship with that space. It became one of his safe spaces. He became comfortable. And it must have been week four or five. And as we went through that line of bushes off the path, you could see his shoulders relax. A physical weight was lifted off this wee guy. Relationships developed, flourished. Communication developed and increased. We saw self-confidence, motivation. 
His gran told me that they didn't have the fight at the door before leaving home. It wasn't such a struggle to get to nursery. He was skipping and excited to get into nursery to see the practitioners he worked with and his friends. This was a wee boy that the transition from early years into primary school became much easier due to these relationships. When I spoke to the nursery six months later, they told me that they massively increased their outdoor provision, both on site and off site. And it was amazing the results they had. They said they saw loads of increases of positive behavior and developments of confidence relationships and emotional stability within their children. So our social well-being. This refers to being and feeling secure in relationships with family, friends, community, having a sense of belonging. Quite often we'll have um, parents coming out on our nurturing nature uh, work and some of the parents are using this time as their contact time. These are parents that are living through really difficult situations themselves and are not actually allowed to see their own children without supervision. I was one a few years ago now, uh, one group, the nursery told me that they'd been trying to get this dad in for the last couple of years. But this dad had had a, a bad experience at school. He wasn't comfortable to be in the nursery environment. But outdoor play, aye, I'll give that a shot. So he came out with us, he joined us in our sessions and it was amazing. I felt genuinely so privileged to be able to, to witness what happened, to see him and his daughter that he basically didn't know, develop a bond, to hear them giggling as they lied in the hammock, to watch them running around the field, chasing butterflies together, sliding down a hill in a tarpaulin. It was absolutely wonderful. Another time, a different year, different local authority, was pulled aside by a practitioner and she said, Gordon, I just need to tell you, we've never seen that mum and that child smile and laugh together. And again, this wasn't something magic that we had done. This was allowing these people to have this opportunity to play in a natural space and to enjoy themselves. And it can be really heartbreaking to know the chaotic lives that some of our families come from. But the power of the outdoors is amazing. And it was again, wonderful to see these relationships build and for this uh, opportunity to take place. So we've mentioned open-ended resources before and we do love those parts at LTL. Um, we did a webinar on that a few weeks ago. So if you want more information on those parts, I would recommend watching that. The open-ended resources can be moved about and used in so many different ways. It often relies or results in collaboration and collaboration is an excellent way to develop and build relationships. I've also had many practitioners telling me that um, play together can transcend language barriers. Often children with English as an additional language can get on and play with other children and they can have fun together and still build these bonds and relationships, developing their social well-being. As well as that, it's a great opportunity for that language acquisition. Final point before moving on that I'm going to make is the importance of nurture. It's great for children to be nurtured. It's an absolute need, it's a must. But let's also give children that opportunity to nurture others and to nurture things. Is it growing um, fruits and vegetables in the nursery garden? Is it caring? I've seen some um, nurseries with chickens on site. Can they care where the, the children take responsibility and lead for that? And it's a great experience and opportunity for them. I could go on and tell stories all afternoon, but I know I'm not allowed. Uh, so a final thought before I pass over to Steve is that we know that the outdoors is a fantastic thing for the children and a fantastic thing for their mental health and well-being. But one thing is that these benefits for the children are benefits that we can get to. So I would encourage you to take the children outside to see those benefits for them, for yourself, but also reap some of those rewards and benefits for you too. Thank you very much. I'll pass over now.
Hi everybody. Okay, my turn now. Um, I'm Steve. Uh, I, I'm going to basically take all that really interesting information from Gordon and translate it into our actual nursery spaces. So giving you a few ideas and suggestions about ways in which to support children's health and well-being in your nursery space. Um, uh, we obviously preach the converted in relation to the fact that we all know how important it is. I just want to think of some practical ways in which we can help support that happening in our nursery spaces. Now, the one thing that's hard about that is that there's lots of you out there and you're all at different stages of your practice. You have different outdoor spaces, tarmac, small, big, the whole works. So it's quite tricky. So what I've tried to do is put together some ideas and suggestions that are cheap and cheerful and simple, but also linked to lots of different types of spaces. So hopefully there's something in there for everybody. Um, obviously we're here to help all the time. So if there's something that doesn't um, appear, you maybe ask a question later or perhaps get in touch at a later date and we'll try and help as much as we can. So starting really quickly, um, just on this first slide, um, most of my slides are, are, are photographs. So, but just this first slide, I just wanted to kind of focus on the idea of making the most of what you've got, because obviously we all have different spaces. So um, if you think you need some support in relation to thinking about what's working brilliantly in your space and what isn't, and your practice maybe needs a bit of a kind of kickstart, or you're actually trying to think about new ways to, to promote health and well-being, maybe um, having a look at one of our audits might be quite useful. So it's an online resource, it's, it's available through the website website and it's just a template basically to help support you think about what's working and what's not what's good and what's bad spaces that are maybe um, not working quite so well or things that you're not necessarily um, delivering on as well as you could and um, so that might be helpful and um, that's that's there as like I say as a template and um, free flow opportunities obviously incredibly important not necessarily always possible but important and um, particularly in relation to um, uh, uh, providing that choice for children essentially um, I put in opportunities for self-selecting and tidying away just because in inside in nursery they're in in on in the playrooms and um, there's an expectation that children will tidy up there's an expectation that there will be responsibility for resources that children will um uh, share and so on and so forth and the message outside should be exactly the same there's no reason why there should be any difference so the opportunity to self-select but also to put away rather than picking and dropping that opportunity for everything to have a place is still important and that sense of of of, of belonging outside and and being connected to the outside space and knowing where everything is is an important part of health and well-being. And I popped in unused spaces there as well and repurposing spaces just because I work with lots of nurseries that have um, it's their, their practice has been going on for quite a long time and everything is just the way it is but actually there are a few spaces that maybe you know become a bit of a dumping ground in a corner or aren't used so much or is maybe a bit dark and damp but actually we've managed to change those spaces into interesting little nooks and crannies little secretive spaces for those children who maybe are a bit more sedentary or a bit more um, a bit less physical so actually moving a few bits and pieces and re looking at our space with a fresh eye sometimes helps you to think about ways in which you can repurpose different spaces. Um, access engaging with nature super important and I know some of you won't have access to nature you'll have tarmac spaces or rubbery spaces but I'm going to give you some ideas in a bit about how to do that and obviously nature is everywhere it's in the in between the paving slabs it's in the crook and uh, little cracks in the walls it's every in the weeds it's everywhere so you may have a great big field or you may have just a couple of boxes but nature is important and we'll talk about that in a bit and then finally, Gordon mentioned about learning off-site. So if your site is really difficult or tricky or it's a temporary space or it's very small or it's shared, then maybe think about your surrounding environments. What are the possibilities in relation to adding value to children's um, health and well-being and their learning outside there? So it might be a graveyard, it might be a, 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 a rough space, it could be anywhere that's basically just sort of within walking distance of school. It doesn't have to be a beautiful meadow. But that idea of basically giving children the opportunity to, to, to go further and beyond their, their nursery space. Okay, so I mentioned about self-selection and tidying away and a bit of routine outside. So I just wanted to chuck in that um, uh, child accessible storage thing to start with. I've worked with so many nurseries that have some outdoor storage, but it's not accessible to children and quite often isn't accessible to adults, to be honest. Apart from the couple of bits and pieces in the front that you can just grab and pull, everything else is just this mountain of stuff that you're in danger of kind of collapsing on you as you open the doors. So having storage is a really good way to obviously allow the children to self-select, but also to put away. I'm a big fan of, of picking, and drop, um, picking and dropping in terms of storage. So examples on the screen here, trolleys and uh, boxes on wheels, um, low level chests, that kind of thing. Storage dotted around rather than any one big unit that takes up tons of floor space. Dotted around to make sure that children can access different areas, but also it's easy for them to pick things up and put things back in again. Um, 
it's quicker as well in terms of tidying up. Obviously, tidying up is less exciting than getting things out. If you can dump all your stuff on a trolley and it's wheeled back in, or you can dump all your stuff in a flexi tub hanging on the fence, for example, it's a simple thing to do. It's quite an easy thing to grab and dump rather than having to be, having to be super, super tidy. But at least it's in one location that can be accessed to later date without having to find, find it because you've lost it. Okay, um, Gordon mentioned loose materials, obviously a big fan of loose materials. We do a lot of loose material work. Um, most nurseries I work with have loose materials in some form. It's not a particularly new phenomenon. Um, a lot of nurseries do it really well compared to transitioning into, into primary school. Um, but quite a lot of nurseries as well, and you may relate to this, um, have started it and it's going really well, but actually it's become something that's be, been a bit, kind of a bit tired and things have got broken and lost and gone home in pockets and disappeared on the roof and disappeared behind things or dropped behind fences. So just having a bit of a reflection about where you're at in terms of loose materials and what you're offering. You're essentially looking for quite a range of a variety of sizes and shapes and scales. So things that are too big for children to carry, so they've got to manipulate their bodies and get their friends to help. And um, Natural materials as well as man-made materials as well. Of course, you don't want everything to be um, um, a quick fix and over in no time, but equally some stuff that lasts a bit longer is really useful. Um, temporary resources like this little boy on the screen here who's having a fabby time in, his, in the cardboard. Cardboard is obviously a perfect opportunity to play with for ages and then it gets recycled job done sorted so temporary and permanent stuff as natural man made as well lots of opportunities again for perseverance problem solving teamwork i've written some stuff on there um, higher order thinking pride in your achievement really happy that you've achieved something practicing your skills a bit more a bit more lots of um child-led learning i love loose materials for the fact that basically you don't necessarily need to intervene as an adult in the same way there's an opportunity basically for children to learn from each other and to watch other children and maybe sort of learn um, from from their peers and from the other children in the environment what they're doing with them and get some ideas themselves lots of child-led learning without adult intervention i love that I should have said, actually I forgot to say, we have got a, 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 a booklet on our website that's free about loose materials if that's useful and also a great list of loose materials and ideas of where to get things from. So again, get in touch if you need help that way. Um, so planting and growing, I just wanted to kind of uh, touch on the whole nature side of things. So because I, again, I appreciate that not everybody has access to massive green space. Um, I personally am a big fan of um, sort of these three elements to planting and growing in nurseries. So purposeful, play focus and low maintenance. So definitely low maintenance. So, so many nurseries, you, you guys um, plant in containers and plants and planting bulbs and planting vegetables and stuff. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant, nothing wrong with that at all. But eventually it becomes a bit of a maintenance hassle or the children don't take much notice of it anymore or they just use it to run around or cycle around where it may be. And just think about the longevity of how, how much impact that has. So, so a bit of variety have I think about this bit of variety so and um, purposeful play I'm thinking of, of creating planting and things that actually can be used for other purposes so that idea here in the middle of the screen about about printing um, with resources so you so using material to create a sort of folded sandwich and then pressing the materials down and um, with a tool or with a stone to release the pigment to create pictures um, you can do some fantastic stuff with fruit trees so apples i've got several nurseries that we grow apples on the fence and, and the children train that it, all you have to do is bend the branches and train the um, branches along the fence so that, is, that apples are always accessible when they when they're ready to be harvested um, on the right hand side there you can see pots of lavender so this is a nursery i work with where the children had had the responsibility and the and and the, and the um, enjoyment of growing from seed to create small plants but then um, nurturing those plants and then and then putting them in pots, decorating the pots, and then passing them on to their families and friends to pass on that love and, and to share that love and to and to see it, it, it grow elsewhere. Um, the Baker and Lone Log Lawn logo there is about uh, uh, basically planting wheat. So literally low maintenance, but with a with a high impact. So you plant a meter square of wheat. The wheat grows. You chop it with your scissors and you and you harvest it with your scissors. And then you work with the children to pummel the pummel the um, wheat itself, turn it into flour, bake some bread, have a fabby snack. So it's just short term, quick fix stuff that basically incorporates the growing element, but isn't necessarily a maintenance headache. Couple more ideas there in relation to strawberries and vertical pallets. So that idea of attaching weed suppressant membranes to the back of pallets and then filling it with soil, cable tying it to the fence, perfect height for children to be able to collect the strawberries and to see the bees and butterflies arriving. Willow and bamboo and big fans again, tall, easy to grow, super cheap, great for screening, hardy so the children can get in there and mess about inside and it's not something that's gonna break or be, or be damaged in any way. And if it is, it grows really quickly. And then hanging baskets, again, I like that idea of being able to take them home and sharing that love with your, with your, with your parents. 
Um, okay. Um, again, just carry on, just with this green, this green theme. Um, so uh, other ways on the screen here to, to, to green up your space, again, with a variety of advantages. So low maintenance, uh, cheap, um, helps zone different spaces, so creating different atmospheres in different areas, feeling like you're moving between different areas, catering for different children's um, health and well-being needs, attracting nature, bringing in colour, um, opportunities for exploration and discovery, um, opportunities to share with your mums and dads at home, so that idea of taking your potato sack back to the house, for example, and keeping it over the holidays or over the weekend. Um, uh, the screen at the bottom there is a, just a standard shed that was adapted by a parent to help support with you know, theatre, some role playing, all that kind of thing, but it's got a green roof. And then the picture in the middle here of this boy making this amazing den, Obviously, den materials are widely available, but not everybody has access to, to green space. So you know, asking parents or asking tree surgeons or asking people to donate branches and bits of stick and green materials to help support den making gives a whole new element to shelter building and, and, and den making. So it's just thinking about ways in which you can have those. Bit. And obviously, the leaves change over time and things change over time and eventually might be recycled. But that's part of the fun, the transition of, of, of play. Uh, last one on 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 uh, green space in terms of just two contrasts here. So the one on the left is one of the nurseries that worked out a lot in in Glasgow, and um, we obviously introduced or they introduced a uh, willow into tyres there again. Super easy to do, grows prolifically. The one thing that I suppose is it gets a bad press about is the fact it grows so much that it's actually quite difficult to maintain. But you know what? If you spend a bit of time with the children snipping and cutting on a regular basis and knitting it back together using fine motor skills to help support children to knit it together. It's actually really simple to keep a hold of. It's just when you leave it for a long time and it grows crazily that it's impossible to then start to cut back. On the bottom right hand side, that's just about um, encouraging nurseries to, to make the most of the green they have got. If you've got bushes and trees, let's get the children in there. Let's, let's um, channel little holes and create little spaces and give the children the opportunity to be in and amongst. That feeling of enclosure, that feeling of nurture, that feeling of, of, of being away from prying eyes, all those things that support children's confidence and resilience and health and well-being, I think are vital, really vital. It seems a shame to have plants that just look pretty but don't actually have a purpose. Um, Carrying on just, just really quickly here, so this is, a, this is a sort of plea really I suppose to those nurses that do have a bit of green space to think about wilding up a bit. So um, avoiding this whole maintenance idea and having to have constantly have things mown and chopped and cut with an inch of their lives and letting biodiversity recolonate, giving the children the chance to explore and discover and investigate um, and, and see the changes in the seasons. Um, a couple of slides, a couple of pictures I want to pick up on here really quickly. Um, on the left hand side, the picture with the, with the, um, uh, in the bush with the, with the wooden pole across um, I took this in a nursery and I was saying oh it's so you know it's brilliant space and the children had to go in and I was convinced that basically um, that they put these barriers across to stop the children getting into the bushes maybe it was too erosion or something but I was made to eat my words and I'm glad that I was because basically the reason they put this across was more about um, encouraging the children in by all means it wasn't the fence to say no it was the fence to say think about the fact that you have to climb over the wall and into the thing so it was kind of almost cutting off the space in the bush to be a quiet nurturing space, avoiding the fact that children couldn't run in between those two gaps and disturb the children inside. But also when the children were leaving the bush, they had to think about clambering back over again and onto the tarmac. So if there was a child passing by nearby, there was a bit of risk and challenge there and that they had to think about being able to move themselves over and onto the tarmac without crashing into somebody else. So it was a really clever way to access the space. Um, I really like that. On the right hand side, just really quickly at the top corner, that um, mini beast trap door, I don't know what else to call it. So lots of nurseries um, create mini beast hotels, which is brilliant. Again, nothing wrong with that at all, fantastic resource. It's just that oftentimes those resources are created and the process is fantastic, but how often are they monitored? They fall apart, things drop off, interest wanes, all those other things. Of course, that's just a standard thing. I love this idea because it's just there forever. So basically, it's just literally a trap door. This is a fancy one, but it could be a board of any form. And it's, it's like opening a book to another world inside um, Mini Beast world, I suppose. So the idea being that you lift the board up and then underneath is all the um, sticks and stones and bits and pieces. And Mini Beasts are just there. You've got a much greater chance of seeing Mini Beasts and be able to investigate them and accessing it with children, excuse me, um, if you're if it's underneath the board and the board is left to just let the movies get on with it. Um, I tried it on grass once in nursery, so we put it on the grass, left it for a couple of days, and then when we opened the book 
to discover what was underneath. The children were amazed that the grass had gone all yellow and changed colour. So we discussed that. And there were lots of worms that appeared and mini bees and things. So you can do it in different ways, but it's just a really great thing to kind of dip into every so often, um, rather than the mini bees hotel that's popped in the corner that you forget about. Um, this slide here was really um, a bit more about um, just, again, making the most of, of nature in the, in the space and helping to support children's health and well-being in relation to their resilience and their confidence in nature. So I've picked a couple of things here just to kind of highlight that example. Um, bees, particularly, are obviously um, they're in danger and are, are all are pollinating fly insects. But um, most children associate, and again, this is a very stereotypic thing, but most children associate um, fly insects with, with this or with a, somebody screaming or with a member of staff going, oh, oh, oh. And I just, I just wonder if there's a way in which we can support children to, to make the most of their nature experiences. If their only experience of a bee, for example, is the fleeting glimpse of it on a leaf where somebody goes, bee, and that's it. And the only other association is a member of staff or another child going, oh, and trying to avoid it. That's not particularly positive in terms of a long-term caring attitude and development for a connection with nature. So just the idea of ways in which we can support children to, to understand their place in the world and to understand that connection with nature. It's not as hard as you think, just to label the bee thing, it's not as hard as you think to capture bee. If you want any hints and tips, then do get in touch. We've got plenty of ideas and the Bumblebee Conservation Trust can help too. But it's not that difficult. And actually getting up close and personal with a bee in a tube, listening to it buzzing in the ear, children are fascinated. Honestly, I've had some great sessions with children when we've been doing that. Um, be mindful, obviously, of children with anaphylaxis or any sort of um, um, uh, potential allergies. Of course, of course, I'm, I'm very mindful of that. Um, just very quickly on the left hand side, so a couple of random photographs, but again this idea of connecting children with the mini beasts and the, and the beasts within our gardens and within our green spaces. And this slide at the bottom is a, a perspex sheeting or Fresnel lenses, whatever you can get your hands on basically. A bit of masking tape around the outside and then um, slugs and snails and things like that on the top, looking at it from underneath. All the fun stuff with, or all the interesting stuff with snails and slugs happens underneath. So if the children can see that, rather than being horrified by a slug or a snail and its sliminess, maybe there's a fascination to be seen in their moving mouth parts or the sliding of the slime, that kind of thing. Being able to see it in a different way, but in a way they feel more comfortable. And then the top one is just literally um, setting slugs and snails and worms off on a race. So we were busy doing our gardening outside. We had a couple of worms and slugs, two sticks either side of the, of the um, plant pots. Set your worms and your slugs off for a race. Carry on doing what you're doing, playing, having a great time. Come back, see how far your worms and slugs have got. Um, but when I last did this, the, the worm basically twisted itself around the stick and just dropped off and did lots of acrobatics, which the children then copied, which was brilliant. The slug moved quite quickly and the snail didn't move at all. It was in its shell, couldn't be bothered. So then we had the whole thing, of, did a bit of role play around um, slugs and said, can you move like a slug, can you move like a snail? But it was in context in relation to the connection they just had with that piece of nature. Uh, okay, just moving on. Um, this is about, um, uh, again, talking about health and well-being. This is about um, different children requiring different things from different spaces. So not all children are super physical, you know that. Not all children run around like crazies all the time. It's great to have that space, obviously, but also great to have the opportunity to have people um, be able to sort of take themselves off and disappear and do their thing and, and have a bit of fun in a, in, a, in a safe space, but in a space that feels different, feels atmospheric. A couple of examples here. The bottom slide there with the sand is just an example of making the most of all your spaces so again we sort of talked this um, earlier about um, this idea of sort of auditing your space and thinking about the unused areas this was just an awkward little bit in a corner but it was perfect for sand because it meant the children could travel to the sand sit in the sand do their thing and travel away again it wasn't in relation to it wasn't on a journey so it wasn't people passing through it and jumping on top of it it was really easy to get hold of it really easy to get into and then the, and then the picture in the middle here is a movable sheet so when the children's interest moves or the sun moves you can move the sheet with it it's just attached to hooks on a fence um stuck in the ground with tent pegs but you could weigh that down with with logs easily a um, little touch on risk and challenge as well. It's been well documented. It's, 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 it's obvious that, that risk and challenge in children's lives is an important benefit um, within, within um, safe parameters and that idea that basically children are supported in a nursery environment to help and um, challenge themselves and build their resilience and their confidence outside. I love this idea of children becoming more risk literate and this idea that basically risk seems to um, make people worry so much but risk literacy is about children understanding that things do to essentially have a risk and inherent in them but how do you manage that and how can they manage themselves to deal with that risk. Three examples here really quickly. Um, logs changing um, uh, conditions in different weather, so obviously becoming more slippy after rain, that kind of idea. So understanding the differences and having those experiences. 
um, using tools outside, obviously woodwork and metalwork, that kind of thing, and be able to understand that the tool is a, is a potentially a weapon, but how do you use that responsibly and understanding that and building that confidence and helping to support each other. And then finally, just a plea to, for continuity of message between staff. So this idea of setting parameters, this little boy on the rock, setting parameters that you agree as a staff team. So there's a continuity of message so all the children understand what the parameters are outside. So risk, brilliant, uh, you know, bring all those benefits, but, but you all singing from the same song sheet. So the children aren't playing you off against each other and say, well, miss, she said I could do this and he said I could do that. And you've all seen the parameters are the same for every child, the consistent message. Um, Gordon mentioned physical um, uh, physical well-being. So just, just some examples here of translating that into nursery. So choice, movement and choice. The picture on the bottom left hand side is a nursery that is essentially just a great big tarmac space. It's a nursery in Glasgow. They're brilliant. Um, they have lots of opportunities for under, over, around, through in different areas. Everything has gone onto the tarmac. Everything has gone onto the tarmac. Nothing's been dug up or changed. It's just provided different areas and different possibilities. Um, same thing in the bottom right hand corner there, you know, if a child eventually gets to the point where they feel they can walk across that log, brilliant. But if they don't want to and they want to roll down the hill or go underneath or whatever it may be, that's absolutely fine too. It's just providing that opportunity for progression in terms of their experiences and progression in terms of their, um, um, their, 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 their um, abilities. Okay, last slide, or penultimate slide, um, just uh, focus on the weather very quickly, you can't avoid it, but we can capitalise on it in terms of children's experiences. Just some examples here of ways in which you can support children's experiences outside with loose materials, in temporary ways, um, opportunities to move and lift and to, and, to, and to do all those sorts of things, but to essentially be, be outside in the rain or after rain. Um, I'm a big fan of this activity here about what's the best way to get rid of the puddle. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but um, loose materials outside obviously available. Have great fun splashing the puddle, brilliant time, lots of fun, super, super. And then um, challenge the children to, to use whatever they can find. Let's see how quickly we can get rid of the puddle. It's brilliant. Honestly, the, 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 the technology and the, and the and, and competition elements, are, they're, they're having a great time. So have a go at that next time it rains. Um, ice in, in terms of homemade boats are really great as well because it starts to melt in the water so the boat changes its, its shape and, and, and that's a great thing too. Um, okay, just finishing off, I'm getting overexcited. I'm um, just finishing off um, favourite outdoor items. Uh, there are millions and I just picked six because I wanted to kind of get, pick some ideas that are commonplace that you probably already know about or have, you know, but are cheap and cheerful and easy to get hold of, but multifunctional. That's why I chose these, these ideas. Ball bungees, I'm going to show you photographs of these in a sec all on one slide. So ball bungees are little round balls with plastic hoop, with um, elastic hoops. They're brilliant for um, all tarpaulins have pre-drilled holes, eyelets. They're brilliant for pushing the, the elastic through the hole. Ball stays on one side, elastic on the other side, and you can attach them to all sorts of stuff. So great for den building, great for creating wind breaks, so attach them to side of fences so you can literally sit down behind the tarpaulin and be hunkered down if it's windy. Easy for children to manipulate with their fingers, none of this string that you have to kind of, that you can't unknot properly. It's really difficult to unknot afterwards. So lots of um, child orientated activities rather than adults doing it for children. Cheap as well, four or five pounds for sort of 20, 25, that's all. Tarpaulin sheets are amazing for all sorts of stuff. Um, den building, obviously, um, sitting um, on, on something that's dry, basically to keep your bottom dry. Um, uh, parachute games, uh, wind breaks, like I said, so attaching vertically to the fence to sit behind when the wind's blowing. Um, 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 same thing in terms of temperature. So children hiding inside a tarpaulin and we all hide together and we have a little party inside the tarpaulin. And then you get outside and realize actually it's baking in the tarpaulin, but it's freezing outside. Big temperature change, that's quite a nice um, a sort of interactive science experiment. And you can get clear tarpaulins as well. So that idea of sitting underneath the tarpaulin where things are coming down onto you, leaves, rain, that kind of stuff. That's an exciting sensory experience that children seem to enjoy. Uh, wooden pallets, bit of a contentious one. I know they split and they've got nails and stuff and you wouldn't use the ones that are coloured, obviously, because they've been treated. But that idea of uh, if the wood is, is, is in a usable condition, you can turn them into seats, you can turn them into shelving, you can turn them into, into uh, planters, like I said, with the, with the plastic in the back to, attack, to grow plants in. Um, you can split off the wood and use it for simple woodwork because it's nice and soft, so easy to bash hammers and uh, bash nails into. Um, and also sand with sand blocks again, so nice simple wood to be able to get hold of. And we've used the individual wood for signage as well, so children have made outdoor signs, we've hung them around the grounds and stuff, so that kind of thing. It's nice and flexible and cheap. 
scout hammock is basically a hammock that has very long cord on it. So the idea being that if you're not very good at knot tying, all you have to do is wrap it around a few times and then tie it on a knot and, and it holds the children. It's brilliant. It's waterproof. It's really handy. Again, about 17 or 18 pounds, not expensive, but just a great way to see the world from a different view. Small world, always popular, popular inside, popular outside. I love the idea that it's a pers personal to the children as well. So I was asked a few weeks ago about engaging children who are a bit more lonely outside, maybe not as engaged, wandering around a little bit, looking a bit lost. One of the ways I suggested was, I did this, was a little boy that I worked with had um, a dinosaur in his pocket and a little boy had a superhero in his pocket. And we used that to tap into, her, into their enjoyment. So we certainly were building dinosaur nests and superhero um, gardens and all sorts of stuff, but something that basically connected with them, it was a superhero that had in his pocket, basically. I love the idea of size and scale and the fact that it has longevity. Small world never seems to fade. There's always an interest. And finally, open sand is really, really, really um, a great thing to have outside. If you want any advice and support in terms of um, outdoor sand and maintenance, we've got a fantastic free resource on our website that helps support you to think about the national guidance. It's dead simple to do. Um, it's something that's very sensory and obviously makes a big difference. And it, it's a progression outside from the sand tray inside when they only can use their fingers. There are some examples, the ball bungees, et cetera, et cetera, on the right hand side. So that's me. Uh, just finishing off, basically, um, I'll pass back to Claire in a second. Just a quick reminder, we've got our online earlier sessions if you want to get involved with those. Um, we're running, going to be running a forest kindergarten course. We're just finishing off the detail just now, but essentially it's going to be a three-day course across the whole of the UK where you come along and gain a qualification. And Gordon and I are going to be the part, the part of the training team for that. It doesn't have to be a forest space or woodland space. It can be a green space, but it's an opportunity to get to develop your practice a bit more if you fancy that. And then our website with some of the details there of things that we can do to help if we if you if you need it. Um, thanks for listening. I'll pass it back to Claire. Okay, thank you, Steve. That was brilliant, uh, and thank you, Gordon, as well. And we are going to move over to the Q and A section now. As ever, we have more questions than we likely have time for, but we're going to plow through as many as we can. And we're going to start with one um, that says that our playground is completely open to the public outside of normal hours. Uh, so that we find it really hard to leave stuff outside. Uh, do you have any suggestions that might help with that for their outdoor learning? Send that to Gordon. Uh, so for leaving uh, resources outdoors, I think um, Steve mentioned when he was chatting about resources, um, that importance of children uh, taking a part of the routine. So the importance of them putting away and depending on your site, um, for some, it's easier than others to leave things outdoors, but part of that routine and part of that tidying regime can actually be uh, taking things inside. Uh, Steve mentioned uh, the big uh, tubs and trolleys and trucks and things, so that can be a way that is easier to move. I was working with um, a nursery a couple of years ago and they just completely embedded this into their practice. Um, and each day, um, getting towards the end of a session, there was uh, certain parts of the, the, the play space that began to get moved and the children took real ownership over that. Again, for some of the children, it was actually an opportunity to show kind of leadership, organisational, um, and other children, it was just the, the, the physical aspect um, as well. So hopefully that's one suggestion. I think um, I think flexibility as well, like you said, is it's tricky. You the, you don't want to, it, it's a big impact on staff in terms of having to set up a space if it's temporary and there's an opportunity for you know everything has to be tied away at the end of the day. So obviously getting out a ton of stuff and taking back in a ton of stuff is just not really feasible. It's just not really fair and it takes away from the time that you have with the, with the children as well. So um, that idea of having um, different resources for different days, I've done that before. We've had you know we've had sort of um, welly water Wednesdays, that kind of idea where basically we're just outside using what is actually Actually in the space of that example of the um, how to move the the puddle was one example from the, one of those activities so basically there was lots of puddles outside we went outside and just spent the entire time using water so we were in the water with the with the chalk and making paint and we were doing um, shapes and shadows and we were working on and stuff in relation to moving the puddle and shifting the puddle and building over the puddle but all we had was a, a little box of loose materials basically that's all we grabbed and took outside and it was more about just having the space and the water after rain at that point so that's only one instance but but 
but um, the opportunity to basically use that is a, is, 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 a, is a potential. Same sort of thing with things like car tracks and stuff. So, you know, literally using chalk and having have, creating a car track or creating an outside world and can just use loose materials. And um, small world stuff, again, is, is, is easy to transport. And, and you've got the kind of canvas outside to create a big um, sort of small world environment. But all you actually need to add to that is the small world itself, which is easy to pick up and bring outside in a little box. So yeah, it's, that's 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 a tricky one, but there are there are there are a few ways. I think to just to have a final wee bit on top of that. Um, so as Steve's saying as well, uh, sometimes it can be either open playgrounds, but it's also those really small spaces as well. And sometimes it's just not practical to have everything out that you want to. Uh, and so the children having to make those um, come, coming to meet in the middle, shall we say, and to have those discussions is really good in terms of developing that. Um, social uh, communication agreement um, and there's a bit of kind of give as well there um, and it's really good for the children to to be able to have free choice to have and um, to be able to have that self-led lear learning but also to have the the limits and the, the some rules as well to be able to follow in play so getting that that balance of both i think can be really good and sorry, last one very quickly. Multifunction resources too. So if you're just going to take out two or three things because that's easier, make sure that the resources you take out have a variety of functions and a variety of opportunity, so that you may not have as much stuff as you want out, but actually the ways in which children can use them are really varied. Thank you very much. Uh, a second one, sort of in a similar vein. Uh, do, can you guys suggest anything that are alternatives to sheds? Because in the area this person is working, their sheds tend to get vandalised, so everything inside has been ruined. Any alternatives? Um, I, if it's if it's for as a permanent resource, do you mean? Is it was is that mentioned? If it's if it's permanent, and um, uh, I'm a quite a big fan of um, low level chests. For example, is that a possibility? So the idea of having something with a with a supported hinge, so when the, it's lifted up and the children can self-select the resources, there's no like sort of the hinge dropping down on the children's fingers. It's there to be used, but it could be disguised using um, planters and stuff. I don't. I don't. Is it a, a permanent thing, Claire? Was that mentioned or? It was just the shed was all that was asked for. Uh, an alternative to a shed. I. Okay. Permanent on that basis. Um, I can only I can only think of that idea of of hanging things off fences. So I'm a big again a big fan of baskets hanging off fences and flexi tubs. So that sort of drop and run kind of idea. So you can select what you need, but when you're tidying away again, it's quite quick to just dump loads of stuff in and then shift it inside. Even if it just even if it just sits in the corner inside. So um, heavy vandalised sites are are, are are more tricky, obviously. But that idea and be able to sort of disguise the resources outside or be able to sort of move them back in is is a possibility. I've seen um, you get, I mean, again, it depends on a uh, size of space that you're, you're working with as well, but if you get some um, really quite small shipping containers um, that are, you know, they're, they're good, they're reasonably secure, they're not, nothing is ever going to be 100%, um, but something that I did see that was really pretty cool was uh, one of the really small shipping containers, I think it must have been about 10 foot by 10 foot, um, but around that they had um, large ton bags and it was their growing space. Um, and that meant that you couldn't get underneath the container at all. Um, and it also just made it a bit awkward to climb on top of the container. Um, and again, it can be just uh, trying to, to find these, I know different organizations that have worked with uh, construction companies, but local construction, uh, and sometimes construction companies might be part of the con considered construction scheme, wanting to give back to the community. Um, but again, it can depend on size. And um, it's possible to disguise as well. So that that picture I showed of the of the examples of storage outdoors. So um, plants have done that before as well, where the nursery have had planters outside that aren't really used, they're a bit overgrown and stuff. And we've trans changed a couple of those. So dug out the soil and then put um, resources in there. And sometimes we've covered them with little bits of astroturf or we've they put plastic um, uh, covers on the top of them. But basically they just look like planters and they're just dotted around and they're part of the outdoor experience. But actually for, for the children and the staff and they know they've actually got resources within them. So they don't look like a storage unit you would attack it there's like random planters marvelous thank you ever so much uh, next one how do i start using areas outside of our school grounds it, um, it's something that we do regularly uh, sometimes the, the groups that we work with are already using some of these spaces and sometimes they've they've never been out and explored the spaces that are out and about in their local community and one of the first bit, uh, one of the main things i guess is to, to to develop a knowledge of your local community
Okay, so when I was chatting earlier, I was talking about the benefits that can come from something as simple as a walk. Um, and if it's something that's new, very often I'll suggest to, to start smaller and then build up, build up that stamina, uh, build up that the physical resilience, but also build up that knowledge of your spaces. And over time, as you go different places and you manage to get further each time, then you might discover some little secret places, things like that. And also to take into consideration different local policies as well. Um, with the kind of rise of different um, outdoor uh, initiatives. Some places are getting used much, much more than others. Um, and so there, there's some local authorities that are um, you know, like to, to be aware of where you're working. So you might have an outdoor learning um, or outdoor educator based within the council that can be a really great person to speak to. And they can say, actually, in your area, there's a brilliant space over here that's been getting used, or they might ask to, to refrain from another space. I think it depends on how long you're wanting to go to a space, or is it just, is it is it a walkthrough? Then, hey, let's go, let's go and take our, um, us and the children out. Um, or are we wanting to go and spend the morning there, spend the afternoon there? Um, so it can depend as well on how long you're wanting to use the space for. Right? But definitely investigating your area um, and quite often someone in your local authority might be able to, to support you um, in that. Okay, thank you very much. And the final question, gents, for you guys today is how do we make the bug trap door? Uh, well, please send me a picture if you make one. Um, so the one I showed you was a bit of a fancy one. It was a, a parent who made it and had carved it and it looked really lovely. Essentially, it was just a piece of wood that he'd that he'd sort of decorated ornately. Um, but I, I've done it plenty of times after that, um, just with pieces of board. So literally a piece of hardboard um, from a DIY store or somewhere similar. Um, I, I've had children decorate. You know, obviously we're not going to have children. Well, you could get children to carve carve it but if it's just a piece of flat hardboard it's hard to carve so ask the children to decorate it lots of mini beast pictures lots of opportunities to kind of be creative outside um and then to basically just just lay it on the ground that's it that's the beauty of that's what i love so much is that it's easily accessible by the children it, you literally lift it off but underneath that world continues on year round all the time it continues on and there's always an opportunity to find a mini beast in some form down there so um if you're in a kind of environment that where you can make it a bit deeper that's quite good so if you in a sort of um, maybe more woodlandy space or there's an area you can dig down into the ground a bit more and create a little pit so with um, some sticks and some stones and stuff so you're creating a little area that works quite well but like I said I've done it before as well where I put it on the grass and the grass has changed colour and then we've looked at the sort of slimy mini beast under there so um, a bit of depth is good but essentially it's just a piece of a piece of board and um, and a whole world waiting for you. Lovely okay thank you Gordon, thank you, Steve, for your uh, presentations and your Q&A answers today. That's been fabulous. Thank you to those of you that joined us in Zoom for your questions and your participation. Thank you to those of you on Facebook and to the team behind there who have been taking the questions there. Apologies to anyone whose question we didn't get to. There were a couple more that came through just a little bit too late at the end, unfortunately. So hopefully, if you want to re-watch this, we may have covered it earlier if you joined us a bit later. This has been recorded and will be put on YouTube in the next few days once we get um, through the editing stage. But we'll say goodbye, we'll sign off, we'll see you another week for another webinar. Stay safe, take care, goodbye. Bye. See you later. Thanks for joining.